warblers. This is a black pole warbler that um, is typically here just as a stopover. So it spends its summer months in the boreal forests in northern Canada and winters in northern South America, east of the Andes. So it has sort of an annual journey of more than 12,000 miles, which is amazing. And then on the bottom left here, we have a broad winged hawk which we can also sometimes see in Arlington County. It's similar to our black pole warbler in that it's usually just passing through. We don't typically have broad wing hawks that are here um, for a whole season, but if you're lucky, you get a chance to see them as they're moving both in the spring and the fall. Right. So hopping right in. Um, migration, right? How do we define it? Um, we can think of migration as the relatively long distance movement of animals from one place to another. And that term relative is key, right? Because when we think about some species like the monarch butterfly, um, we know that they travel really far distances, right? 3,000 miles between here and Mexico. And yet other animals make somewhat small seasonal movements, maybe from the upland area of a forest, like you can see here, to the low-lying bottomland portion of a forest where they can find seasonal pools of water. So it, it really is relative, but even if it is a short movement that these animals are making, um, it typically falls under, right, or includes some of these other features. So even if it is a short movement, um, it might be a seasonal movement, so it's happening in response to seasonal changes. And again, it typically involves movement from one habitat to another. And that's true whether it's a long distance migration or a short distance migration, right? Those monarch butterflies are occupying two very different habitats between here and Mexico where they winter. And our amphibian friends are occupying some very different habitats when we think about an upland forest area compared to that bottom land where they would find those seasonal pools, okay? All right, before we jump into how and why animals migrate and some of those local examples, I did wanna give some examples of really extreme migrants just because it's sort of awe-inspiring when we think about how far some animals travel on a regular basis. These are some of um, sort of the most extreme examples we can find in the world. On the left here, we have the Arctic tern, which migrates further than any other bird does. Um, they really move between the poles, so they're sort of chasing a, a never-ending summer. They, um, in their lifetime, or sorry, in a, in a year, will migrate um, 25,000 miles, so the amount of <laughs> distance or the um, the distance or the number of miles that they're clocking is really pretty extraordinary. And that 25,000 miles number comes from um, past research where researchers knew that turns um, were summering in one spot and wintering in another spot and then they sort of drew a straight line between those two locations. And now that technology has improved, researchers have discovered that turns don't always take the straight route, right? They might meander a little bit. And so there are some instances of turns traveling um, more than 40,000 or 40,000 miles uh, in, a, in a year, which is pretty incredible. So their babies will be born um, in the Arctic in the summer months and then um, when it's our winter, right, they're gonna travel to the Antarctic and chase that never ending summer. Um, at the bottom here, we have our humpback whale travels further than any other mammal on the planet, right? These animals are um, usually about 80,000 pounds and in a year they travel about 5,000 miles. So. We've got humpback whales in every ocean of the world, and in the summer months, they're typically in cooler waters that are nutrient rich, where they can find krill and plankton to eat. That's where their babies are born. And then in the winter months, or our winter months, they're moving to warmer waters closer to the equator, um, where their babies have a little bit of an easier time, right, growing up, and there's less predation from sharks. So. I really like to think on days when I'm sort of stressed out, right, that somewhere in the world there's an amazing humpback whale making this 5,000 mile journey. Um, just pretty incredible to think about. And then over here on the right, we've got the blue wildebeest, which obviously we don't have in Arlington County. These are animals that are native to the continent of Africa, um, but they 
uh, and they don't really migrate far distances compared to the Arctic tern or the humpback whale, but they do migrate in really extreme numbers. So there will be millions of wildebeest that migrate at a time, and oftentimes they're moving um, with other animals as well. So zebras might be mixed in there, different species of wildebeest, and they're moving in response to seasonal changes and typically looking for water. So. Um, in the areas of Kenya and Tanzania are where you're going to find blue wildebeest. Okay, so these are just some extreme examples, right, of animals that move around to get what they need. And they sort of beg the question of why does any animal do this, right? Why does any animal leave the comforts of one area, right, and take that risk to get to another area? So there are really considerable costs when we think about the energy expended to migrate and the risk that's involved, right? Our migratory animals are really vulnerable in a lot of ways. So there have to be some benefits to making these incredible journeys. Otherwise, it wouldn't keep happening, right? Animals wouldn't have evolved to keep making these incredible journeys if there wasn't a reason. So when animals are migrating, they are typically looking for favorable living and breeding conditions. And, you know, when they're moving to other areas, they're looking for seasonally abundant food and water resources, um, whether it's a humpback whale, right, traveling to those nutrient rich waters or a wildebeest, right, looking for water during the driest seasons of the year. Um, they're often traveling to areas with lower levels of predation and competition. So when you think about the songbirds that make their way to our areas in the summertime from the tropics, where things usually are pretty good, right? It's warm and there's plenty to eat. Um, a lot of times they are looking to escape competition from other similar species. Animals, when they migrate, are looking for a seasonally optimal, optimal or favorable environment. So when we think about like our amphibians that are moving around in the forest, they're looking for that optimal environment to breed and lay eggs. Um, and then sometimes, right, our animals that migrate are looking for habitat that's beneficial to multiple life stages. So when we think about, for example, the monarch butterfly, they're migrating north and they're looking for areas that contain milkweed, which is what you're seeing here, that's common milkweed, because that milkweed is going to support their young, right? The adults don't necessarily need milkweed, but the babies certainly do. So we've got um, a differential grasshopper here in this picture, right? One of those reasons that songbirds in our area make their way to our area during the spring and summer. Down here, we've got an osprey, which you'll see in Arlington County if you get closer to the Potomac River. Um, one thing I really love about osprey is that they know to make their return journey to our area at the same time that a lot of migratory fish are making their way back up the Potomac River. So they're really timing things to make sure that those abundant food resources are available when they get here. Pretty incredible. Okay, so. Um, I know we had a few folks who just joined in um, sort of as we had already started, I just want to make sure that they are doing okay. They know what we're looking at. They know how to use Teams. John, is everybody doing all right? Doing good. Thanks for asking. Okay. Yep. From my end, everyone seems to be all right. Awesome. Just making sure. Okay. So in terms of finding their way, right, we, um, we kind of take it for granted that animals move around and they know how to get where they're going, right? Um, but there are some really amazing things at work when we think about how animals navigate and figure out where and when they need to leave and go. Um, one of the big questions when we think about migration is um, whether or not migration is a learned behavior or it's an innate in inherited behavior. And there's been a lot of research done over the years to sort of help figure this out. Um, what researchers have found is that a lot of times when we think about migration as a learned behavior, um, it's really mostly mammals as well as some larger birds that learn how to migrate from their parents, right? Um, there was research done um, as late as 2018 where scientists were studying um, big game out west, specifically bighorn sheep, trying to figure out how do they know when and where to move around. Um, and they discovered that bighorn sheep, as well as a lot of other large game mammals, have to learn that behavior from their parents. 
If they don't learn it from their parents, they don't know where to go. And that's true for some large birds as well. So when we think about um, whooping cranes as well as Canada geese, right, both of these species need their parents to figure out how to go and when to go. And that's the reason, right, that um, we've been able to successfully restore some species like the whooping crane or if um, you saw the movie Fly Away Home back in the 90s, right, that's based on a true story um, about a researcher and a scientist who worked with a flock of imprinted Canada geese and helped them get where they needed to go at the right time of year. Um, research has also shown that there are a number of species um, that migrate as a result of innate inherited behavior um, that they've inherited through their genes from their parents, right? They, um, they make these journeys without ever having done it before and without having their parents show them the way. And that's the case with most fish. So when we think about um, salmon making their return journey up rivers, um, salmon are doing that on their own, right? Um, as well as the, the initial journey that they take out to the ocean, right? They don't have parents showing them the way. That's also true for a number of insects, whether it's dragonflies or monarch butterflies. Oftentimes, parents are not there. Um, the parents have died in some instances, right, a few months before. Um, and yet, somehow, these insects know how to get where they need to be at the right time of year. Its uh, research has shown as well that some birds are also born with that innate inherited behavior. And scientists studied this and sort of tried to separate it out from potential learned behavior. Um, and the way they did that was to selectively breed that characteristic out of a bird, right? So researchers were trying to figure out are birds, right, do they learn this behavior or is this behavior innate? And by being able to breed the behavior out of a bird, they realized that that behavior was genetically linked, right? There were genes involved and it was something that was inherited from their parents and not necessarily learned. So some birds do a little of both. Some birds definitely have to learn from their parents and other birds, right, just know what to do because they were born that way. Um, in terms of figuring out where to go and, and when to go, animals depend on a number of different things to get there. Um, the first is visual and scent-based landmarks. So when I say landmark, I don't mean right turn right at the 7-Eleven, right? We're thinking of really big things like mountain ranges or huge bodies of water and places or habitats that animals can learn to recognize and know as safe places to stop over. Um, all of these things help an animal find its way. And environmental cues like temperature or weather help an animal know what time of year right, it needs to move, as well as day length. Right? When we think about those changing seasons, the days are getting longer or shorter, the temperature is changing, and that really clues in or clues an animal in and tells an animal that it's time to get moving. Um, light from the sun, moon, and stars is also beneficial and helps animals figure out where to go. And this is not really a huge leap for us, right? It's really in very recent history that people have had paper maps and GPS units and smartphones, right? For a very long time throughout human history, right? We've navigated with the help of the sun, the moon, and the stars, and there's no reason that animals wouldn't either. Um, there was research done back in the 1960s with warblers and indigo buntings where they actually put them in a planetarium to try and determine if the stars and their orientation to the stars helped them figure out where to go. And sure enough, right, it was discovered that that's definitely the case. Um, more recent research done in 2010 um, looked at whether or not, right, birds are using the light from the sun, moon, and stars, or they're using right, Earth's magnetic field to figure out where to go. And the results of that research basically determined that birds are doing a little bit of both. So there are some birds that maybe are definitely depending on the sun, moon, and stars. Other birds maybe are a little more dependent on Earth's magnetic field, right? But they might be doing a little bit of both. Um, our understanding of an animal's ability to use Earth's magnetic field to navigate is really recent. Um, it's just in the early 2000s that scientists even discovered the organ that some animals use um, to detect Earth's magnetic field. So it was first detected in worms. And more recent research has discovered the protein in a bird's eye that helps a bird really see 
Earth's magnetic field makes that bird's eye more sensitive to that light. So if we look over here on the picture on the right, you can see sort of from a bird's perspective what Earth's magnetic field looks like from different directions. So in some ways you could kind of think of it as a visual landmark as well, um, but they are using Earth's magnetic field to figure out where they need to go, right? So that some combination of the above is true for a lot of different animals. Um, I've got a homing pigeon down here just because they are um, one of the birds out there that uses scent based landmarks. So they're able to recognize sort of their home ground um, based on its scent, even from the air. And obviously these guys don't migrate far, but they do have that ability to go back to where they came from. So scientists have studied them pretty extensively. I've got honeybees down here just as a great example of an insect that does use some combination of all of the above to navigate and get where they're going. Again, not truly migratory, but really well studied animals that give us some sense of how animals navigate in the world. Um, researchers have found that honeybees actually prefer to use the sun to get where they're going, but if they need to, they'll depend on the magnetic field of the earth as sort of a backup. Okay, so. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, lots of different ways for animals to figure out when and where they need to get where they're going. Um, next, they wanted to talk about how they go so far with so little, right? Um, it's pretty amazing some of these thousand mile journeys that a lot of these animals undertake. And so knowing how they do that without having, you know, huge bodies or huge resource stores that they carry with them, right? They're not wearing backpacks and they're not driving the car with the trunk full of groceries. Um, so how do they do it? Um, one way that they do it is to make use of prevailing winds, um, as well as routes that they know that have ample food, water, and shelter along the way. And the result of that is the flyways that you see, at least when we think of birds, right? These sort of regular routes that birds typically take to get from one place to another in the world. Um, in the Americas, we often see sort of a, a clockwise direction when it comes to migration. So for whatever reason, birds are typically flying um, north over land, and then when they head south for the winter, they're flying over typically open water, at least on the east coast, right? When we have, we think about the Pacific coast, right, there's still going to be that clockwise direction, but it's going to look a little different. Um, I included these two birds here because they're great examples of different strategies that animals take when it comes to sleep when they're migrating. Um, there's been a lot of research done and a lot of questions asked about how do animals sleep when they're on the move, right? We know that um, often birds will migrate at night without stopping. And so how does an animal do that, right? We need our eight hours, otherwise we're a little bit of a mess. And so um, there are really two different strategies that birds take um, to deal with that sort of lack of sleep. When we think about the Swainson's thrush as well as other thrushes, they're actually going to take power naps during the day so that they can stay awake all night when it's time to fly. So research found that they take nine second power naps throughout the day on their journeys and then they're ready to go by the time nighttime rolls around. Alpine swifts take a little bit of a different strategy and they actually have the ability to sleep while they fly. So really re recent research done on alpine swifts has shown um, that there are alpine swifts that stay in flight for more than 200 days at a time, which means they're not coming down to sleep and they're not coming down to rest. So they have to be sleeping in some capacity while they are flying in the air. Um, and what they found is that they have the ability to sort of shut down one half of their brain at a time. And there are other birds that can do this as well that have to make really long journeys. Um, they're going to just sort of shut down one half of their brain and then keep the other half awake to help them sort of with reduced flying activities during that time. And their brain, halves of their brain sort of take turns um, while they're flying and half sleeping. Okay. Um, there are other ways that birds get so far with so little. One way is to really stock up and bulk up before the journey, and that's true for other animals as well, not just birds. Um, we'll talk more about that in a little bit because there's a pretty extreme example that I'd love to share with you, so we're gonna get there. Um, and then finally, a lot of animals migrate together, 
right? Whether it's Canada geese migrating in a flock or broad wing hawks migrating in a kettle or American shad, right, migrating in a school. A lot of, by migrating together in such large groups, right, there's a reduction in the energy load, particularly for flying birds like Canada geese that are taking turns being the lead in that V that we see. Um, but it also sort of reduces predation on the way. So it makes it a little less risky um, despite the journey itself still being pretty risky, right? If you're going with a lot of other animals, there's less of a chance that you're gonna get picked off, right? Maybe the buddy next to you will. Okay. So, right, we've talked a lot uh, so far about what migration is, um, you know, what it looks like for animals, how they figure out where to go and how to get there. But we haven't really talked about how we know where animals go. Um, I want everyone to just sort of think about that for a minute because, again, it's sort of something that we take for granted, right? We know that certain birds leave and come at certain times of year, same with insects and fish. Um, and, you know, we don't often think about, oh, at one point in history, we probably didn't fully understand this. And we definitely didn't, right? Um, in Aristotle's lifetime, he proposed um, that red starts that he was seeing in Greece, what is now Greece, um, turn into robins, right? He had observed that those two bird species were never in the area at the same time. Um, but instead of thinking that maybe they went somewhere, his solution, right, before there were scientific processes to investigate things, was just to propose that, right, one bird turned into the other. And of course, lots of people believed him. And so those beliefs got passed down for a long time. Um, during Pliny the Elder's lifetime, he wrote about this long-held belief that cranes in his area went to war at certain times of the year, and no one questioned it, right? It was just what everyone believed, and it was a long-held belief that he wrote about as something that like, oh, we've known this forever, right? The cranes go to war. Um, so we had these sort of silly beliefs in the past without having the technology needed to really study where these animals are going and why we're not seeing them anymore. Um, even as late as the 1500s and 1600s, right, folks really didn't understand necessarily where animals were going. This picture over on the top right from that time, it's actually a woodcut, and it shows right in this fishing net what are actually birds, right, not fish. So there was this belief, this long-held belief that swallows, right, hibernated at the bottom of lakes in mud, right? People looked around, they didn't understand where the swallows were going at certain times of year. And so the answer, obviously, right, was that swallows must be hanging out in the mud at the bottom of lakes. So um, I do think it's unfair to say that people really had no idea where animals were going and what they were doing. We certainly know um, that people all throughout history have depended on animals to survive. And so they've tracked those journeys and oftentimes moved with animals because they depended on those animals for survival. Um, if they didn't move with the animals, then they were aware of when those animals were available in our area. And a great example um, for us along the Potomac is the annual migration of shad and herring that make their way up the Potomac River. The native people that lives here, as well as early European settlers, really heavily depended on those annual migrations. So they may not have known where the shad and the herring were going or coming from, um, but they definitely knew when they were here and dependent on them. Now we have all kinds of technologies that have helped us figure out where animals go and you know what they're doing when they're there. So. The earliest example of a technology to help us understand migration is certainly bands or tags that are placed on an animal's legs or wings. Um, and the first example of this was actually um, just a little piece of twine that Audubon tied onto a bird and that bird returned and he was able to see that same bird wearing that twine. So he was aware, right, that um, birds returned, like left and came back, right? It was the same individuals, um, but he couldn't necessarily figure out where those birds were going. And that's sort of one of the difficult things about bands and tags. Um, in the early 1900s, Paul Barch of the Smithsonian Institution banded 23 black crown night herons um, in the sort of modern way we think about bands. So he put right a little band on those birds' legs and was able to sort of track individuals from one season to the next. 
again, right, bands have their downsides, right? They're only um, good if the animal can be found again, whether it's found in its winter or summer habitat or um, wherever it was originally banded, right? It's dependent on finding the animal again. And it doesn't always tell us where the animal has been or where it's gone. I mean, it's not possible with all animals, right? With birds, it's fairly easy to put Right, a little band on their foot. Some birds, like this trumpeter swan in the picture down here, right, might be banded on their wings. But other animals like fish are going to be almost impossible to put a band on. Right? How would you get something to stay on a fish? So other technologies are definitely needed. Bands and tags have their limitations for sure. Um, today we use, we still use bands, um, but we've got a lot, of, a lot of other technology as well that we use. Um, one example are geolocators or geologgers that are used um, in combination with bands and they collect uh, light data to determine the length and day or time of solar noon um, at various locations along the animal's journey. So you can really track where an animal has been. Um, but again, right, you have to be able to find the animal again in most cases for that data to be useful, especially for the smallest animals like songbirds that geolocators are placed on, right? They can't have really big bands or collars to carry a geolocator that can do all sorts of complicated things. A lot of times really it just is like a literal solar panel and a microchip inside a teeny tiny backpack like you're seeing here um, on the bottom right. And so that bird has to be found again for that geolocator to really be useful. Um, another technology that we use in today's world are called pit tags, and they're a little electronic microchips, sort of like the microchips that we put into our pets, right, if we're worried about them running away and getting lost. Um, pit tags are often used in animals that go by sort of common locations on a, on a regular basis. So we have to know a little bit about the animal already. Fish, migratory fish are a great candidate for pit tags. We sort of know where they go and if we're interested in tracking individuals, that pit tag is placed in the fish and then the fish swims past basically a, a transponder or a scanner that collects that information as the fish uh, swims past. We've got radio tracking that uses radio waves, um, satellite tracking that uses satellites, and GPS tracking that uses satellites in a little bit of a different way. Um, so there are benefits and you know non-benefits to all of these different strategies, and it really just depends on the animal and what we know about the animal and what we're interested in finding out about the animal um, when it comes to deciding what technology is best to use. But it's, all this technology has certainly allowed us to really sort of break apart the world of animal migration and understand where animals are going, what time of year right, they're leaving, how they're getting there, the journeys that they take. So there's some really incredible technology out there that's allowing us to sort of better understand the natural world. Okay, let's take a deep break or a little break, take a deep breath. <laughs> it's definitely um, difficult for me to give a presentation without having feedback from you guys. I feel like I'm just talking, talking, talking at my computer screen. So um, if anybody has any questions so far, I'm happy to sort of pause and answer those questions. Or if we want to just keep on going, we can do that. Everybody doing okay? Yeah? Okay, great. Okay. So I wanted to jump into a few species that we can look for in Arlington that are migratory. And we're going to start with our birds because when we think about migratory animals, right, most people think of birds first. They've got wings. They can, in theory, go wherever they want in the world. Um, so we'll start with birds. <coughs> I chose three examples that I think sort of highlight different strategies. Um, and also that we're maybe more likely to see in our area. And we'll start with the Perula over here, right? The northern Perula is one of the warblers um, that makes its way to our area and during the summer months. So there are a number of warblers that if you're a really excellent birder, you can see during this time of year, we're really, I think, kind of reaching the, the end of spring migrating season for warblers. But a lot of those warblers continue on their journey, like the black pole warbler that we saw at the very beginning of the presentation to the boreal forests in Canada, right? We're just gonna see them as they stop over to eat a caterpillar or get a drink of water. 
The northern perula is one of the warblers like red starts and common yellow throats that actually does stay here for the whole summer season. So they're a teeny little bird. They weigh um, between a tenth to four tenths of an ounce. They winter in Florida and southern Central America, and they make the long journey here for the summer months um, where they can find, find plenty of food for their young. So um, like other warblers, they eat predominantly insects. Uh, northern Prulas really love caterpillars and small spiders, and they're going to be feeding that high protein diet to their babies to sort of give them the best chance. Um, and they're making that journey for those young, right? They, they have good success when they make that journey. Um, and so they continue to make that journey year after year. Um, over on the right, we have our ring-billed gull, which I included because it sort of does the opposite of a lot of other birds in our area. Um, we're gonna see ring-billed gulls in the wintertime here. Um, in the summertime, they actually nest in really gigantic flocks um, in the Northern United States and Southern Canada, kind of in the Midwest. Um, and so, you know, they're here in the winter and we often don't think of birds as migrating here to the winter, but they definitely do. I also wanted to include these guys because they are really common birds. You can think of them as the parking lot seagull. Um, they are generalists, right? They don't need anything special. If you've ever had your french fries stolen, um, you know that gulls will make do with pretty much whatever they can find. Um, and so they're really successful in a lot of ways and deserve probably more admiration than we often give them. So you'll see these guys in the winter time around here and then in the summer, they're gonna make the journey north, right? With lots of other seagulls um, to have their babies further north. And then finally, I included maybe one of our tiniest bird migrants, right? The ruby-throated hummingbird, which weighs between a tenth to two tenths of an ounce, right? A really tiny little bird that makes this amazing 500 mile journey um, from Central America. So our little tiny hummingbird is actually gonna swim, or I was about to say swim, definitely don't swim, um, fly all the way across the Gulf of Mexico without stopping. And you have to wonder how does a bird that tiny make that journey without stopping for food or water or rest? And they do it by really bulking up, right? So um, before they make that journey, they actually double their fat mass in their bodies. And by the time the journey is over, they have completely spent that calorie load that they um, bulked up with, right? So they use all that energy in that one journey, but it is a pretty incredible and amazing journey, right? They only weigh, right, a two tenths of an ounce and they're flying 500 miles without stopping. So they'll be here in the summertime. I've heard lots of reports already um, of folks seeing hummingbirds visiting their feeders. While they're here, they're gonna have their babies just like the perulas do. They're here because, right, they've got, they've had success, right, breeding here. Um, there's less competition and plenty of food. Um, they're gonna, right, the adults will drink nectar at feeders, but they're also gonna eat small insects, and those insects are what they're gonna feed their babies. Almost all birds, I would actually say yes, all birds, uh, feed their babies some type of protein, right? Nectar and plant material just isn't gonna cut it for a little baby bird that's growing. So even our birds that we think of um, as only eating seeds, like goldfinches, are gonna feed their babies protein. Okay, all right, so moving on to the next group of animals, um, migratory insects. There are so many insects that migrate that we um, often don't think about, right? I feel like monarch butterflies are pretty popular. Most of us have heard about that incredible 3,000 mile multi-generational journey that we make, which I'll go into in just a minute. Um, but lots of insects migrate. So milkweed beetles migrate, common buckeyes, painted ladies, right? Different types of butterflies. Um, additional dragonflies besides just the green darner, which is probably the most famous example because there's really recent research out there about this migration that, you know, up to very recently folks didn't understand very well. So we'll start with our monarch. Right? Again, it makes that 3,000 mile journey from the OML um, fir forest in Mexico northwards to where we are in the summertime. Um, it is multiple generations that make that journey northwards. So there'll be the generation that overwinters in Mexico, right? They, um, in the spring, right, get ready to fly. They fly a little bit north to have babies and die. Then those babies, right, hatch and grow and become adult butterflies, fly a little bit north, 
right, have egg, breed, lay eggs, um, and then die, and then another generation will do the same thing. And depending on where a monarch ends up, right, it can be anywhere between two and four generations that makes that journey to, to their sort of northernmost point. Um, the monarchs that um, are born sort of towards the end of the summer here are going to be the ones who make the return journey south. So they're going south without ever having done it before. Um, two to three to four generations to five generations removed from their ancestors who made that initial journey in the spring north, and they're going to return south. Um, like we talked about earlier, right, they make that journey just like lots of animals do because of, right, prime habitat for breeding and surviving. So their little larvae need all different kinds of milkweed to survive, and they're gonna find it here. So they're coming here to do it. Our green darner dragonflies have a pretty interesting, also multi-generational migration. Um, this sort of confusing graphic here is basically just telling us that in the springtime, um, the first generation of green darner dragonflies are born, right? They fly north. They breed, they mate, they die. That second generation, right, is going to be born and they're going to fly south and make that return journey. They will die, breed and die. And then that third generation hangs out down south um, in Florida and surrounding areas. And that's where they spend the winter. Um, I like to point out that dragonflies, right, we're used to seeing sort of this beautiful adult form but they do spend a good portion of their life as aquatic larvae. And so the length of time that it takes a dragonfly um, to move from egg to larva to adult might vary depending on which generation they are a part of for green darners. So this first and second generation, that change is gonna happen fairly rapidly. But for this third generation, right, they're gonna hang out as larva for a pretty long time down there during the winter. So it's pretty amazing when we think about these insects making this journey, right, without ever having done it before. Oftentimes many, many generations removed from their original ancestor insect, right, her great grandfather or great great grandfather um, who made that journey north. Okay. Um, green darners are one of 16 dragonfly species that migrates in the, in the U.S. Um, I don't know them all, but there is research out there if you're interested in learning more about dragonfly migration. It's pretty fascinating. All right. Everybody's still doing okay? Yes, hopefully. Okay. We're moving on to migratory fish. Two great examples in our area along the Potomac River um, that do opposite things, right? So we've got our American shad. Um, that migrates from the Atlantic Ocean up the Potomac River every spring to spawn and breed. Um, they have really fascinating life cycles. They're born right in freshwater streams. They spend that first summer swimming south and usually by winter they are in the Atlantic Ocean. Their bodies have made that adjustment from freshwater to saltwater and they have grown to be fingerling or larger. Um, they're going to spend three to five years swimming around in the Atlantic Ocean up and down the Atlantic coast from um, the Bay of Fundy in Maine all the way down to parts of Florida. They're just going to swim back and forth with the seasons until they reach their adult size um, and they're ready to come back up the river that they were born. So scientists don't know exactly how shad figure out how to get back to the river where they were born, but they do it. Um, there is some research that indicates they, dispend, they um, depend on sort of a fish sense of smell, so they're able to, to smell, for lack of a better word, the, the fresh water that's coming out of those rivers and into the ocean and know, right, oh, this smells like my home river, um, and make their way back up in the springtime. Uh, American shad in particular have seen pretty significant restoration to their population um, in the last probably 10 years or so. Their population really took a pretty steep downturn. They were incredibly overfished. Um, they faced some pretty significant challenges as a result of pollution and damming along rivers that prevented them from getting to their spawning and breeding grounds. So there's been some awesome work done locally on the Potomac River. Um, that's been used as, exam as an example of, you know, a success, a restoration success that folks all over the country or all over, all over the East Coast are looking at. American eels are going to do the opposite, right? As larvae, they are born in the Sargasso Sea. 
Um, they drift with the current as larva. It takes them about a year to reach the Atlantic coast. And at that point, um, they are considered glass eels. So they have their fishy form, but they're actually translucent. Um, and they'll make their way from brackish water to fresh water and spend a good portion of their adult lives living um, in fresh water. If you attended Ken's eels talk uh, last week, you probably learned all about eels. So I'm not going to talk about them too much. Um, but they will spend time in freshwater streams. Um, I know that they are one of the few fish that we actually find in Gulf Branch right outside of the nature center. So there have to be other fish there to eat because they are pretty significant predators, but um, you know, we don't find a whole lot. So it's exciting that eels are there. Um, and when they reach sexual maturity and they're ready to go, they will make that return journey back to the Atlantic and their bodies um, go through some pretty significant changes. They um, they bulk up, right? They get fat just like our little hummingbirds. Their eyes get much bigger and sort of adjust to being able to see the blue light of ocean waters. So they adapt to adapt in a lot of really cool ways to make that change. All right. Moving on to our migratory amphibians. These guys make really tiny journeys compared to a lot of the other animals that we've talked about, right? They are not migrating 5,000 miles like humpback whales or, um, you know, 12,000 miles like our, our black pole warbler, but they are making some pretty significant changes on a seasonal basis. So the two species that I wanted to highlight are the spotted salamander and the wood frog. Both of these species depend on seasonal pools of water that can be found in the forests in our area. Um, sadly, in Arlington County, there really isn't a lot of habitat left for these guys. The only two places where spotted salamanders and wood frogs have been found are in the seasonal ponds at both Long Branch and Gulf Branch Nature Centers. So, um, a lot of the other habitat right, that they would have used, other vernal pools has been developed or paved or who knows, right, over the years. Um, and so those two places are really the only two places we find these two species in the county. Spotted salamanders spend most of their lives underground. So they're gonna live underground in the forest, under the leaf litter, um, in tunnels and burrows, oftentimes in tunnels and burrows created by other animals like shrews. Um, and they're gonna hang out there until right, they get those environmental cues, the ground has warmed up, the days are getting longer, and they'll make that journey to a vernal pool where they're breeding right, and laying eggs. And they're choosing this area because of its sort of optimal habitat, like we talked about earlier on in the presentation. Vernal pools don't have fish in them, so they're a great place for an amphibian who lays these soft, squishy eggs without any protection right, to lay their eggs because they know right, they'll have a good chance of success there. Our wood frogs are doing the same thing, although a little different. Um, they spend most of their lives sort of in uh, sort of bottomland forests. So they're going to hang out in sort of forested wetlands for most of the year. In the wintertime, they might move to more upland areas where they hibernate under the leaf litter. And then come springtime, again, those environmental cues, warmer soil temperature, warmer air temperature, longer days. It's going to tell them, hey, it's time, right? We're ready to head down to the vernal pool. And they'll go down to the vernal pool and they will breed and lay eggs just like the spotted salamander does. So. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, again, these guys are making fairly small migrations compared to a lot of the other animals we've talked about this evening. Um, but for the size of the animal, right, they are traveling pretty far. Um, wood frogs can travel meter, hundreds of meters throughout their life, and they are sometimes pretty dangerous journeys, right? If there are roads that need to be crossed, um, there's research out there that says, I believe, let me look at my notes here. Yeah, a study in Massachusetts um, found that salamanders that travel uh, more than 100 meters to get to vernal pools um, have only an 80% chance of survival. And salamanders that have to travel uh, more than 500 meters typically have about a 60% chance of survival. So the further they have to go to get to a vernal pool, the greater chance there is they're gonna have to cross a road or a path or some other danger to get there. So we definitely need vernal pools and we need more of them for these guys. All right, our last group here is fairly small. Um, there aren't too many mammals in our area that we consider migratory, right? They might make some seasonal movements. When we think about white-tailed deer, um, they might move 
um, from our yards to the forest and back, right? Depending on the seasons and what's growing and what's tasty, maybe our hostas or definitely not the spice bush in the woods. So, but those um, movements are not necessarily considered migrations. Um, they don't fit all of those categories that we talked about at the beginning. The migratory mammals in our area that are considered um, true migrants are the bats. Um, we have, looking at my notes again, I'm trying to remember how many bat species we have in Arlington County. We have only three known bat species in Arlington County. One is the big brown bat. Um, the other is, I think, the eastern silver bat. And then we've got the little brown bat. Um, and then we've got five species that maybe historically occurred in Arlington County, but haven't been found in a long time. Um, these two bats, the big brown bat and the little brown bat, are both cave hibernators, which means they spend their winters hibernating in large groups in caves. And those cave areas are oftentimes in very different places than where they spend the summers when they're raising babies and eating mosquitoes and moths and all the wonderful things that bats do. So um, both big brown bats and little brown bats have been known to travel you know, 60 miles or more to get to those winter cave habitats um, because that's what they like, right? They like hanging out um, with lots of other bats in the wintertime to stay warm, to stay protected. Um, this strategy in some ways has been part of their downfall, um, particularly for the little brown bat. I won't talk too much about it, but they have faced some really serious declines in their population as a result of white nose syndrome, which is a fungus that gets into the caves. And because there's so many bats together in the caves, really impacts a lot of bats at one time. Big brown bats, because they're bigger, have been sort of less impacted by white nose syndrome. Um, they're not woken up as frequently during the winter months. Um, and when they are, right, they've got sort of greater stores to help them through that woken up time before they go back to hibernating. So um, these guys are great. You know, if you're interested in learning more about bats, I definitely encourage you to do that. But they really are the only two mammals in our area that we would consider migratory. OK, things you can do to help. Um, preventing light pollution is huge. We talked earlier about all the different species that depend on the moon and the stars to navigate, that navigate at night. Um, and so if you are a property owner, you're making sure um, that you've got lights that are unidirectional and are only lighting the areas that need to be lit at night so that light is not sort of going skywards and disorienting all of our creatures that are making their nighttime major movements. Um, preventing water pollution, so all the things that you can do to do that, right, for our migratory fish, just making sure that those freshwater habitats are good for them when they get here and when they live here, like our eels. Eliminating pesticide and insecticide use, right? So many of our songbirds come to our area because of the food source that's here in the spring and summer in the form of insects. Um, and if we're eliminating those insects from our yards, we're not going to see birds. Um, that sort of ties into this next suggestion, which is to plant native plants, right? There's all kinds of research out there that shows that natives support greater populations of insects, which in turn support greater populations of songbirds. So if you're a property owner, planting natives in your yard is one of the greatest things you can do, not just for migratory wildlife, but for all wildlife that live in our area. Promoting smarter development, so encouraging um, wildlife corridors, right? We're great at having parks, but a lot of times those parks are not connected in a meaningful way. Um, about 40% of you know, natural areas in the United States isn't connected to other natural areas in a way that's beneficial to wildlife. So we really need to think about how we're developing discouraging sprawl, right? developing in a way that is smart, right, and allowing for those wildlife corridors so animals can move when they need to and not end up in our yards. Protecting and improving habitat, right, whether it's planting natives or working with us to remove invasives from some of our forest interiors, um, making sure that we have forested areas that are large enough to even have a forest interior, right? Birds like wood thrushes and swainson thrushes need that deep forest to feel safe and secure to breed, right? They're here in our area in the spring and summer for those forest interiors, so we want to make sure they remain. Um, vernal pools, we already talked about their importance and how they've seen such a decline, right? Oftentimes sort of bottom land like that is the first to be developed. Um, and so, you know, finding ways to create vernal pools, restore vernal pools, um, provide habitat around vernal pools so that 
you know, our wood frogs and our spotted salamanders have a place to live at other times of the year, right? Super helpful. Um, and then finally, preventing window strikes for our migratory birds. If you have um, property that has, you know, large glass windows, you want to make sure that those windows either have something hanging on the outside that breaks up that pane of glass that to a bird just looks like more sky, um, or decals or stickers on the inside, just something to sort of, again, break up that reflection that looks like, oh, hey, I can keep flying here. So all kinds of easy things we can do um, to support migratory animals, right? We've got um, in this picture some bee balm, which is a native plant, and in this picture a field of goldenrod, which is great for our insects that are migrating south, right? Like our monarch butterflies need that boost of energy, so those fall blooming or late blooming flowers like goldenrod are super important. And then I included just this little image here of the night sky right before, right? light pollution had been addressed and then after light pollution had been addressed so you can see that difference we often don't appreciate it in our area because it looks like this most of the time right but if you're a bird right that depends on seeing the stars to get where you're going this is going to be very difficult and this is much better okay okay um if you want to learn more there are Lots of organizations that have great information out there as well as ways to volunteer and get involved um, in a citizen science component. So I included those here and I'm gonna send the, the PowerPoint around um, in an email. So you'll have this page to look at if you'd like to explore some of those. Um, and I've also included uh, beyond this thank you page, some of the resources that I use that you're welcome to explore as well as a photo page, just because not all the photos were mine. So I wanted to give credit where credit was due. So that's it. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see your faces again. So give me just one second. OK. And if anyone has questions, I know no questions came up during the presentation, but if you've got any, I would love to answer your questions now if you have them. Um, Maddie, you we did get one question Great. In, the, yeah. uh, in the chat box. So um, uh, Christine asks, could uh, could you possibly go into a, a little more detail on uh, the creation of vernal pools and what uh, what we can do to help those out? Yeah, sure. So there are resources out there if you're interested in creating a vernal pool on your property, um, what that looks like and what you need to do. Um, you know, it's it's difficult because like we talked about vernal pools also um, to be successful need that surrounding habitat as well right so they need a forest around them where salamanders and wood frogs can go to spend the winter um, and so a lot of times just creating a vernal pool in our backyard might not be enough right the salamanders have to get there somewhere and they have to be coming from a forest to do it um, but there are resources out there and I'm happy to, I don't have them on hand, but I'm happy to, to share some of those resources with you when I send my follow-up email, for sure. Are there any other questions? Um, I have a question. Sure. Again. Um, you were, what bat, other bat did you mention, a silver bat? Yeah, the Eastern silver bat. Let me check my notes. I want to make sure I'm getting the name right. I don't have it written down. Um, there's a great document called The Wildlife of Arlington County that was yeah. put together by our natural resources specialist and his team um, that gives you all the information about like every wildlife group possible um, that you can find in Arlington County. Um, and so that's where I drew the information about bats. And so if I can also share a link to that if you are interested. I believe it's the eastern silver bat, the big brown bat, and the little brown bat that you would find in Arlington County. The other five species that were um, historically here or maybe likely to be here haven't been found. Um, I will say though that bats are really difficult to study um, and you know, difficult to find, difficult to keep track of. Um, there aren't a ton of bat specialists out there um, and so it's possible that there are more bat species in Arlington County. We just haven't been able to find them. So keep that in mind too. Um, but, you know, eight species is probably the most that we ever had at any point in time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Following up on the bats, mm -hmm. you said that they will travel about 60 miles to mm -hmm. caves 
Where are the caves that the bats? Yeah, to? that's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer. I would imagine maybe, you know, like near Luray would be my guess. Um, those are the only like local caves that I can think of, but I don't know for sure. So don't quote me on that. <laughs> Um, I can do more research and try and find out for you, but in my reading for this presentation, I didn't find anything about where they're going. Again, super mysterious. Um, yeah. Up until very recently, we didn't even know where a lot of bats go in the wintertime, whether they are, you know, cave hibernating bats or they're hibernating in the forest, right? We call them tree bats. They're going to hibernate under leaf litter or tree bark. Um, lots of mystery with that. It's really like a malign species for a long time. Um, so there hasn't been as much research on them as there are species like birds. Right? Just not as loved, which is unfortunate. Okay. I have a question. Yes. I had a question you had mentioned about scent being used. Yes. I didn't think birds had a good sense yeah. of smell. I know yeah, most birds do not. Um, I know uh, turkey vulture or black turkey vultures have a sense of smell. Black vultures do not. Apparently homing pigeons have some sort of sense of smell, um, but no, most birds are going to use visual clues to get where they need to go. Um, fish are going to use sort of the equivalent of scent. I don't know how a fish smells or what, what that looks or feels like for a fish, um, but that's how it's been explained to me, um, is that they sort of smell their home river and they, they know where to go. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Maddie, we have another question from the uh, the chat here. Um, uh, this one is coming from EH. Uh, they ask, are turtles that come on to land to lay eggs considered migratory? Yeah, I unfortunately don't know very much about sea turtles. And it's because I've never worked in an area where you could find sea turtles. <laughs> um, I would imagine that they fit some of those definitions, right? They're making a seasonal movement um, because they're looking for sort of prime habitat for their young. Um, they're not staying for any length of time, right? Um, a mother sea, sea turtle is going to dig her nest and lay her eggs and go immediately back to the ocean. Um, I don't know how far they're traveling to get inland. I don't know how far out into the ocean they go. So um, unfortunately, that's a question that I can't answer. Um, but again, would be happy to do more research for you. Hey, Maddie, I actually uh, did a little bit of research on sea turtles, and uh, to be very clear, I have no background whatsoever in <laughs> any of this stuff, but I did take a class um, through uh, ANS, so I happen to do a little bit. Um, I happen to know that each of the sea turtles, um, and there are, what, seven different species, um, they actually travel thousands, tens of thousands of miles um, through their, uh, what do you call it, their their eggs to babies to grown-ups and teenage and whatever, yeah. tens of thousands. Um, so That's they awesome. are actually very definitely fitting the category of yeah. migratory. I would um, agree. What, what about lake turtles? Um, I happen to live on a lake, and the question then is, what about turtles that live in a lake? And they come into my backyard and they yeah, lay, eggs. lay their eggs. Yep. Yeah. Is that I, still migratory. I mean, what's well? How how far does it have to go? Like in the terms yeah. of a salamander, who was five hundred yeah, meters. Right. Yeah, a salamander is going. You know, just a just a couple of meters in some instances, um, but definitely seeking out that different habitat. Um, and I would you know, think the same would be true for a pond turtle that's coming on land to lay its eggs, right? That's a very different habitat than in the water where it spends most of its life. Um, you know, I don't know for sure. Um, it's in some ways kind of wishy-washy, which is unfortunate. Uh, but certainly based on the things that we've talked about in this presentation, I would think that a turtle would qualify. Definitely a sea turtle based on what we just learned, um, but probably pond turtles as well. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you my silly, silly uh, little presentation. That would be great. great. And if not, just deep six it. Yeah, thank you. That would be great. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Maddie, I'm going to sign off here, but I just okay. want to say thank you. Um, this was truly fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. This is my thank first uh, virtual presentation in this format, you know, and so everything is sort of new for me. Very strange not to be able to see you all or have that sort of personal feedback. 
Um, yeah. So I really appreciate yeah. you hanging with me while I get the hang of it. Yeah, I don't believe it. I think you're an old pro at this. Oh, thanks. <laughs> to the next one. Uh, I'll look for those emails. Awesome. Thank Maddie, you. Thank you so much. Truly, truly awesome. And uh, our little uh, tech man in the back, thank you also. Uh, much appreciated. It's uh, <laughs> not, okay. not a problem. Thank you, Maddie. You did the, the heavy lifting here. Thanks. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great evening. You too. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? Are we ready to sign off for the evening? I'm seeing some nods. <laughs> okay. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much um, for joining us this evening. Thank you for being patient with me while I give it a go for the first time. Um, and hopefully we will see you all again soon. Take care. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.